Back in the early 2000s, much of what you see behind me here in the east end of London was an urban wasteland. Then, in 2005, a transformation began. The Games of the 30th Olympiad in 2012 are awarded to the city of London. The focus of London's successful bid for the 2012 Olympic Games was legacy through the sustainability and adaptability of stadium and venue architecture. So what lessons can be learned from this and past Olympics and what can we expect from Tokyo 2020? Hi Peter, how are you? Good, thank you. Welcome to Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. It looks pretty impressive, doesn't it? It does. Let me show you around. Cool. In 2012, this 560-acre park hosted the Olympic and Paralympic Games. They were deemed a great success, but many argue that their legacy has been even more impressive. So here we are, in the heart of the park. Over there is the London Aquatic Centre, our amazing pool, the Arsenal Metal Orbit, and the London Stadium just behind us. But from here, we also get to see the Copper Box Arena up in the north, and we've got the Vela Park, and right in the north of the park, the Lee Valley Hockey and Tennis Centre. All of these legacy venues well used for both playing sport, but also big international sporting competitions after the Games. Before this area of East London, known as Stratford, became home to the Games, it was London's industrial heartland for more than a century. However, as the London docks and factories shuttered in the 1960s, it left the neighbourhood at a loss. So if we went back to 2005, when we won the bit, the area was completely different. There were some factories, there were some um, homes, um, but there was also a lot of areas that you just didn't want to go to. There were railheads, there were huge pylons that straddled the site. Famously, tons and tons of earth had to be cleaned here on site because of the diesel and the acid that had been uh, processed in the various factories. So all of that was cleansed and then reset. While the ground was being prepared for the development of the Olympic site, discussions about its legacy and what would happen to the park after the Games were happening in tandem. How important was legacy as part of the successful London 2012 Olympic bid? Well, I think there was an overarching focus on legacy to ensure that apart from the glorious week or two in 2012, these venues will deliver for the local community, for the region, for the nation for 20 to 30 years. Sean Dawson is the chief executive of Lee Valley Regional Park Authority, a government appointed body set up to regenerate 10,000 acres of regional park while also providing sport venues and open spaces, some of which traverses Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Before the bid, we had planned for a velo park, for a white water centre, so we had those plans already. And of course what the Games did was deliver bigger and better venues than we could have delivered without the Games. And what the Games benefited from that was having a, a ready-made legacy client in place to shape the legacy for those venues. Today, Lee Valley operates three venues that were used at the Olympics, two of which are found in Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, the Hockey and Tennis Centre and the Velodrome. The rest of the sporting complex, including the Aquatic Centre, the Copper Box Arena and the London Stadium, are all run by an organisation whose purpose really began on the day that the Games finished. What is the London Legacy Development Corporation? It's quite a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> you should have come up with a shorter name. Yeah. We were formed in 2012. And the idea is that the Legacy Corporation really takes the spirit of the Paralympic and Olympic Games in 2012 and uses the opportunity of those games to benefit local people. That means bringing the venues back into use for local people and bringing new inward investments into the area, including jobs and opportunity uh, generally. The motivation to ensure that the legacy of the London Olympics will be sustained for future generations was derived from the mistakes of past Olympics. Issues such as the ecological impact and displacement of locals plagued previous editions, while abandoned venues reclaimed by nature were common sites. It was definitely sad to look at venues in other Olympic cities that aren't delivering a legacy, that had their week of glory during the Games but haven't delivered in the long term. That public investment hasn't delivered for those communities. Um, and, and it is, that it's an important lesson to learn that you can get it wrong. You don't design these venues correctly with the, the number of audiences that we, we're here to reach out to in mind, well then this would have been a white elephant as well. To ensure that the London Olympics would not make the same mistake, plans were in place from the start, so that the Olympic Park could adapt from a space designed to host thousands of spectators a day to a park for the local community and venues that could fulfil a variety of needs. So the depths can be changed, the booms can come in and out so we get shorter lengths and, and all of that was there right from the start. It just 
wasn't needed for the Games. During the London Olympics, the Aquatic Centre was fitted with spectator wings on the side of the building, increasing its capacity from nearly 3,000 to more than 17,000. Once the Games were over, the wings were removed, so the venue could become a more intimate space for general public use, though it can still scale up by another 1,000 seats to host elite competitions. So this is one of those areas of the park where if you were here 10 years ago, it would have looked completely different. Behind you would have been a bridge taking you over to the stadium, but don't step back now. There's a climbing wall, <laughs> uh, which everybody enjoys coming up. It's a bit steep. Over here, there's the children's playground, a brand new children's playground. But at games time, this was tarmac, this was McDonald's, toilets, souvenir shops. All you can see, this greenery you can see, wasn't, wasn't here. None of the greenery here, yeah. It, all of this has been, was planted and when we reopened the park, or opened the park in 2014, it was a new garden for people to come and enjoy. So where we're standing now, this was a huge bridge at the Games, and you probably didn't even know there was a canal underneath it, but we peeled back some of the layers of the bridge, created this rather spectacular um, reflective effect. The lock behind you has just been restored in the last few years, so that is now a functioning lock for the canals. So there was a, so, sorry, there was a bridge over the top of this? Yes, yeah. The focus on the future meant that for every one pound spent building the Olympic Park, a quarter was invested solely for the Games, while the remaining 75p was earmarked for the legacy of the Games. In the years since, a total of 30 million people have visited Queen Elizabeth Park. While many of the venues here are used regularly, recent reports suggest that a successful Olympic legacy in London is threatened by a serious shortfall in revenue. A report published in 2021 suggested that the general financial outlook of the park is a ticking time bomb. In 2020, trading revenue across the park fell by 30% due to the restrictions caused by the pandemic. However, the cancellation of showpiece events because of the lockdown also helped save the city's taxpayers £7.4 million, largely due to the high costs of running events at the London Stadium. I came here to the London Stadium, as it's now known, back in 2012 and watched some incredible sporting moments that I'll never forget. But that venue is almost unrecognisable to the one you see today. And the transformation into somewhere which hosts football matches has not been an easy one. There was a determination to get the stadium into use, but some disagreement in the run-up to the Games about what that end use should be. We all knew that to make the stadium um, sustainable and have longevity it needed a real anchor tenant to make that work and the most obvious anchor tenant was always going to be a football club but that meant serious investment in transforming the venue into something that could work for football as well as other events and so on now when you look around the world uh, there are very very few olympic stadia that have survived as well as we hope this one will there is a recent report that uh, highlighted some financial pressures that uh, the London Legacy Development Corporation have had. Um, how difficult is it to ensure that these places are open to the community but also make money? I think the stadium is an example of a venue that delivers so much more than the venue itself in terms of local economy, what it delivers for sport, for London, its widest sense. And if it does have financial challenges, and all venues do, it's just different types of challenges, really. Well, then I, I think it's how the Olympic Stadium is the centrepiece of the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. I think we all benefit from that. People tend to, for various reasons, whether political or otherwise, focus on the negative news. But actually, when you look at this place in the round and see the positivity that's here, the extra jobs that have been created, the new buildings that are coming online just behind us here, you can see the benefits more clearly. I don't know whether you've been asked by the Tokyo delegates about what you've been doing here and how you've grown the legacy and ensured that it lasts. Are there any lessons that you've learnt that you would pass on? If you're thinking of putting a bid together, you must be thinking about the legacy right then and, and the impression you're going to make for local people. That's really important. There's not much point, actually, if, if the games are about to be held and you're turning up asking for advice then, because you're then starting from scratch and you're running to catch up. So very important to think about it early. The basic ingredients, I think, are there for them. I think it comes down to who's going to own and manage these venues. If some venues do carry a subsidy, how is it going to be funded? Is it the Tokyo taxpayer? Is it the, the national taxpayer? It is those levels of detail with the right skills to ensure that you know, almost a day after the Games or whenever you can, those venues open 
and their public venues. They've spent a lot of time upgrading existing venues like we did here and some new venues of course as well. There's been a lot of exchange and two-way traffic to try and make sure that they, they get it right and um, I think in the case of Tokyo, I think they will. To host an Olympics is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but ensuring that the legacy of the Games is a strong and lasting one is difficult. While lessons have clearly been learnt, it's still a challenge that host cities wrestle with and will continue to do so. Hi guys, thanks for watching our video. Please subscribe to the channel. But before you do that, we'd love to know your thoughts on any other sporting venues that have hosted big events that you think have done it really well or conversely have done it really badly. Comment below the video to let us know and we'll see you next time.